Aaron, a warm welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. Thanks, thanks for life. Great to, great to be here. Fantastic. For everybody, really excited to, to, to have this conversation with you. And let's start off with, with you, your, your, your back story. You're, you currently run and operate ShopGrok. Where did it and how did it all start? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, ShopGrok's been around for, for almost six years now. Um, but um, prior to that, um, I've, I've, I've been working in, in pricing and in, uh, in, in strategy consulting. So I, I started my career uh, at, at PwC in Sydney and uh, spent a few years there, then went and did an MBA in, in Spain. And from there, went to, to work for McKinsey and Company in Singapore. And, and that's probably where I started um, really delving into the pricing space. Um, was working in um, in pricing across retail, but also some non-retail segments at the time. Um, but but retail is kind of where I you know, built up some expertise and and um, decided to to start to push my career in that direction. Um, and so then uh, my wife and I had our first child in Singapore, and we eventually moved back. And I started with um, Australia's largest retailer, which is called Woolworths, the supermarket. Uh, I was I was the head of price strategy and price analytics there for for a few years. And um, that was an interesting, you know, time as well because it was you know, 2015 to 2017. It was, a, it was a turnaround phase for that company at the time. We were, um, we were losing share to our largest competitor at the time, and, and price was a really big factor in kind of um, trying to kind of get that turnaround happening. Um, so it was a, it was a really interesting learning ground at the time. It was a big, big changeover in management, new CEO, new management team, quite a big company. Uh, so, so it was interesting to be a part of that. Um, but I, yeah, after the MBA, I, I decided I, I wanted to do something entrepreneurial and uh, finally took the plunge early 2018 and uh, started ShopGrok and, and essentially I'm doing similar things to what I was doing uh, in my prior kind of roles, um, but for other retailers and other brands. Um, so we're, we're bootstrapped to, to date and um, we have been very much focused on the Australia New Zealand markets. Um, but um, I'm calling in today from, from Madrid, Spain. So I'm, I'm here in Europe. Um, I've been here for a couple of weeks now. And um, the idea is to start to expand our presence here in Europe and then uh, potentially in the US later this year. So I'm really excited to, to do that while I'm here. We're excited to have you in, in Europe. So it's so a warm welcome again. A warm welcome again. Someone asked me this question a few months ago. And um, the, the question was, Who's in charge of pricing? Is it marketing or is it finance? Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those questions where if you talk to 10 different people in retail, even in similar verticals within retail, you'll get a different answer. So, and, you know, we thought within all of our clients or customers, um, you know, our stakeholders are different. And there's not always the same role description. So uh, it, I think it, it's interesting, like it really depends on, on the culture of the organization, obviously the size of the organization. Um, and sort of how um, how they differentiate. If you know some retailers' price is, is really part of their core strategy, there there might be a price leader in the market. Um, other times, um, you know, they're they're a brand driven organization, or they're very they have a you know other strong um, elements, and price might be less of a of, of a top priority. So um, it just tends tends to to differ. But for larger retailers, you know, they might have a, a pricing function and that own necessarily work in inverted commas own pricing but even then um you know that when i was in my role at woolworths i was the head of price strategy but you certainly wouldn't say that i own pricing <laughs> the, the buying team the category managers are, are really the ones who tend to own you know they set the prices and, and they know the category and um so if there is a pricing function that they tend to provide support um as, you know as far as analysis and data and, and insights and it usually does come down to the buyer um whoever's managing the category to, to really kind of drive, use price as a lever to drive sales growth and, uh, and mm -hmm. profitability at the end of the day. Yes, yeah, so majority of our, our listeners run DTC operations um, or Amazon stores. So they're, they're in the SMB space. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. They set the price initially, you know, the founder will set the price initially, and then it could be a marketing play, particularly if they built out, you know, brand, you know, equity. And, and then um, if finance is not happy about it in terms of profitability, it's, it's, it's an issue. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting nonetheless. Yeah. We find that there often tends to be a, 
uh, a bit of healthy tension in in businesses where there is especially businesses that have an offline and an online presence um there might be you know a traditional off you know brick and mortar part of the business that are trying to drive profitability but then the e-com team are trying to drive you know visitation and um and, and, and click through and and sales online and they want to be really price competitive because it's a lot more transparent for customers online so um, we often find this tension between um, the team, the performance marketing team, or the e-com team, are really trying to drive price competitiveness and and mm-hmm. volume, and perhaps the you know the the, the category managers or, or maybe the store teams are are, are wanting to drive uh, to drive margins. So there mm-hmm. often tends to be you know in, internal conflict as to for exactly you know sets yeah. the price at the end of the day. Speaking of brick and mortar and and, and digital spaces. Where is there more price agility in in e-commerce? You know, in general, given the fact that um, the cost to swap, you know, um, or to check alternatives is much the barriers rather is much lower in comparison to hey, I'm in a B and Q today, and I'm not even going to bother to go to the to the home base in the other side of town to compare prices for you know a toolbox I want to buy. Or I could just pick my phone, I guess, and check prices against Amazon. So what, 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 how's, how's it playing? How's pricing playing out to the consumer that's yeah. either in, in an aisle or, um, you know, at home? Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting. It's definitely um, a, a very interesting part of um, strategy. If you've, if, you've got an, if you've got an offline presence, um, it, it does limit you in some ways um, because you, these days you can't really run you know, there's ways there's ways to do it, but it's hard to run price, different pricing online to to in store unless you're kind of running online only deals and things like that. Because a lot of I would say, you know, I think the latest research that at least 70, 80 percent of in store purchases begin with some sort of online discovery. So it, people are checking price online, then going into store, and if the price isn't the same, then you're gonna you're gonna have an issue with um, with trust. So um, um, yeah, I definitely think that you know. Fuel play e-com retailers have a lot more um, flexibility as far as driving, you know, changes in price multiple times a day, for example, or um, just just really being able to quickly change prices. Um, and in-store you know, brick and mortar traditional retailers, there's actually a significant cost to being able to change the price ticket, physical price tickets that are in stores. Um, mm-hmm. We're seeing a lot of, you know, um, uh, electronic shelving um, shelf tickets happening these days, so it, it's getting mm-hmm. a little bit lower cost to, to be able to change prices in store but um but it, there definitely is a, a substantial cost if you're if you're wanting to change price in store so it makes um the the strategy a little different um interesting and then yeah we are seeing like different strategies employed to to try to combat that so you know a, a retailer with a with a, an in-store presence that's trying to compete with the likes of, of amazon or, or other pure play um, e-com retailers um they may have um, you know, some sort of online only range, for example, or they might have just online only discounts. Um, you might see sort of below the line um, marketing happening. So, you know, if they've got a reasonably um, good you know, personalization or rewards uh, scheme, they might be able to drive um, some um, rewards or discounts below the line through through um, through EDMs or, or other marketing. Um, or in some cases, we're seeing retailers maybe split off and have an entirely separate um, sort of what would seem to the com- to the customer to be an entirely separate company um, operate purely online as part of the, the same business, um, same group of mm. businesses. So um, spin off. Okay. So, yeah. Hmm. So, it's so on this show, space. yeah. So on this show, we're we're on side um, e-commerce, as you can imagine, pure pure play e-commerce, you know, businesses. So so what tips? Would you? Or what frameworks really? We speak frameworks in, in in this um in this pod also. What frameworks? What pricing frameworks would you give pure play e-commerce? You know um you know businesses to thrive in you know in in, in marketplaces in which in which they, they they operate. Yeah, I'd say you definitely have the advantage of of as I said being more flexible around pricing and and being able to to, to make make quick moves and um and 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 um adjust um in a, in a in a quicker way um so i would say that the starting point generally for, for any kind of price strategy work is is to give yourself some transparency so 
typically you would sort of benchmark your range and your pricing to the market and and just see where you are so it might you might find out that you know half your range is, is really uncompetitive and and and, um, and you need to do something about about price you might find that you're actually underpricing in some cases and leaving some money on the table um, so the, the first step is, is usually just to benchmark yourself and see where you are how often that you're competitive how often your competitors are cheaper than you um, and, and just give yourself some sort of starting point um, and then the next step is usually to figure out you know what differentiates your, your brand or your, your business and also what role each product or each group of products within your range uh, plays within your overall strategy. So um, you might have a set of products that um, drive a lot of traffic to your, to your site. Um, so, you know, brands with, 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 you know, um, that, that are um, sought out by customers, you know, the, the Apple iPhone as, as an example. Um, that you know will drive traffic to your site, but but aren't necessarily going to drive much margin. In fact, they, they may even be a loss leader in some cases. But you need some of those products in your range potentially to, to drive the traffic to the site. Um, but then you'll have other products that perhaps it's your own brand, perhaps it's just an exclusive product that you have um, that will drive margin because it's the only place you know your store is the only place that customers can get that product. So you want to be able to you know drive enough customers to your store and then hopefully have them fill their basket with um, items that will eventually drive drive a reasonable margin across the entire basket. So um, making sure you know what the role is of each product in your range and then setting a, a strategy around pricing and promotion um, to, to try to take advantage of that role. So um, um, and then there's different ways to do that, different, different types of approaches, whether it's, you know, a pure EDLP strategy which doesn't work so much um, in, in, in most categories online versus a very high low strategy where you're kind of if you're starting at a higher price, you're doing really deep discounts. And usually something in the middle tends to work best where your your everyday price is sort of fairly competitive and then you're you're using um, targeted promotions to try to drive traffic um, when, when um, in ways that, that sort of give you a, an overall um, uplift in volume. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so there's the, the the external benchmark, and it starts with external benchmarking, which which can be tough in terms of like matching um, where, where you're at against um, you know um, competitors essentially, and then differentiating your brand and product line, knowing your your point of differentiation. So, from product line standpoint, what are your loss leaders? What are your high margin products? And then you once you've identified that, you, you that information sort of equips you to to towards setting a, a Prize and promotion strategy for each of the SKUs, um, which, we're, yeah, we're, okay. So in order for you yeah, to so set the strategy, you need to benchmark and then do it. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, what we often do is is um, set up some tiers for um, for the product range at each each of our um, customers, and so you might have mm. it's usually only you know it might be fifty or a hundred SKUs that really drive you know seventy eighty percent of your traffic and or sales and so it's, it right. tends to be those small small number of, of really high value products where you do need to be really sharp on price and really mm -hmm. have a strategy around those and then you might have a second tier or a third tier of products where um, price is actually less you know either it's less transparent to the customer or, or less important so it might be a you know, products that a um, customer needs to buy and, and, and they'll, just, they'll just put it in their basket because they've come to your site for something else um, so trying to, to understand, you know, which tier each product sits in and then set price accordingly. So those tier one products, you probably need to be tracking the, the market and, and being price competitive and kind of managing price very tactically. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the, the second and third tier products, you're probably optimizing for margin and, um, and, and trying to, you know, remain within a band of competitiveness um, from a price point of view, but not necessarily chasing the market on every single price move. Interesting. Very, very interesting. What is the where is the place space for personalization and dynamic pricing in particularly for e e commerce you know businesses? Yeah, I think if you know, I think it's the holy grail really being able to personalize pricing according to individual customers. Um, but there, there are lots of steps to to get there. I think the first step is is really having a some sort of program um, rewards type program um, that you know allows you to collect some information about your customers to be able to um, to know a bit about them and to be able to 
able to tailor their experience accordingly. Um, and, and obviously you, you need to create incentives for them to, to really want to sign up to that type of program, um, you know, whether it's um, you know, discounts or gifts or um, rewards or you know, cashbacks, et cetera. Lots of different ways to do it. But um, at the end of the day, if you can, if you can develop a program where you know, more than half your sales is sold by, by uh, two customers who are in, uh, in your rewards program, um, then from there, you, you have a lot more information to, to then be able to, to tailor uh, pricing promotions and, and, and other marketing to them on an ongoing basis. Um, so, um, yeah, and price is probably just one part of that. But um, um, if you can get there, then, um, then, yeah, you can definitely sort of figure out um, based on spend patterns, you know, who are your most valuable customers, you know, reward them accordingly. Um, who are the customers that perhaps you are buying one category and you want to expand them to other categories? There's lots of different mm -hmm. um, kind of ways you can then um, segment that customer base and kind of drive mm -hmm. different pricing or different promotions according to uh, their patterns of purchase in the past. I agree with you. I think it's, 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 it's actually more impactful to... To, to get a really high performing loyalty program first before you start to think about dynamic real time dynamic pricing. Um, Absolutely. It yeah. just, I think these yeah, days it, it's it's almost, you know, part of the course you really need to have you need to know more about your customers, you know, to, to be able to yeah. um, build a build a strong retail offer these days. Yeah. Um yeah. gone are the days where you can sort of just place customers on a site and expect customers to come and come and buy them, you know, or, or if you do that, you know, you would, you, you, you're not going to be, be very profitable long term, you know, if all you have, if the only lever you have is price, then, then it, it's, it's, it's not going to work unless you are the price leader, which is, it's just unlikely if you're, you know, an SMB trying to, trying to break into the, to a um, competitive market. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think a, a really strong rewards program is a, is a fantastic way to, um, to drive loyalty and, lock in especially you know these days customers with this you know cost of living you know prices still on the minds you know inflation has peaked but around the world but um the customers still have you know cost of living top of mind price is still a very big factor at the moment and, and customers are willing to shop around perhaps more than than they would at, at other parts of the cycle so um you you know the more you can you know incentivize customers to you know, set, buy more of their basket with with you, the the, the better your your workout. The better. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. And then Google Shopping, in in my opinion, is the biggest shopping comparison website or platform, rather marketplace platform on earth. As in, forget AdWords, just due to the fact that you fulfill by yourself, it's, it's seller fulfilled rather than um, you know marketplace fulfilled. How are you seeing like pricing play out in in Google shopping, particularly if you see the same products um, from different retailers but at different prices in real time in, in in a search result? Yeah, I think it's it's really one of those um, parts of it, of the strategy that that need to be looked at for that, especially that top tier of products I talked about. Um, you know, the, the first port of call for most customers these days, type the product into Google, go to click the shopping button and then see what's there and then click compare. So, you know, that, you know, I know that's the way I shop a lot of the time and, uh, and I'm sure, you know, there's a majority of customers that now do that. So, um, but if, if you can, you know, be at the top of the list or close to the top of the list a lot of the time, you know, you're more likely to, to start to drive brand awareness and customers will come to your site. Either they'll go straight to your site if they have a great experience. Or they might click to your site to buy you know, the, the KBI product, the known value item, um, and then they'll while they're there they'll buy other products. So it, it definitely, you know, I think is is a must-have these days to to at least have a presence on on Google Merchant Feed, um, but also to optimize your spend on that on that channel. Um, and so we do that a little bit with some of our customers. That the easiest way to do it, um, well, probably the, the most the highest ROI, you know, for the least effort um, is simply to make sure you, um, if you have, say, a daily spend, for example, if you're a you know, small retailer, you, you have maybe a daily quota of spend that you want to spend on Google Merchant Feed, you can optimize to exclude things that might be uncompetitive price-wise on a particular day, and you might want to upweight some products that are cheaper than your your um, competition on a particular day. Um, so that's, that's a starting point, you know, an easy way for you to, you know, 
eke out some some ROI on on your spend um, through that channel. It's just to make sure that the products that customers do see that do pop up, you're competitive on those because that'll help drive price perception over time. If if the customer sees your name um, and you're always second, third, fourth on the list, then over time they're going to start to get this perception that, that you're not price competitive. So you kind of want to want to be able to drive that price perception on some of the core products um, to to kind of have customers um, have that perception across your whole range. Yeah, and and for for a digital first brand, you're more nimble to change price prices in real time to be more competitive in comparison to you know a brick 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 and mortar or normally channel you know retailer that needs to sort of cascade those prices down to to stores, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's it definitely you know a um, big big part of um, of an e-commerce you know, marketer's um, kind of arsenal these days, I suppose. Interesting. Interesting. Are you a fan of site-wide sales, or yeah, site-wide sales like twenty percent off the entire you know store? Or yeah, I think I think anything that's that's really broad-based like that, unless it's really well marketed and and drives a lot of traffic to like you know incremental traffic to the store that that wouldn't already have have come to the store through you know through individual um, discounts and, and promotions, um, then then it will always you know. Um, it won't be an efficient promotion, I guess. Um, so you might get you might get a a, a lift. Um, you you know usually will get some sort of lift. Um, but is that your lift really incremental? You know when you take into account um, the, the the loss in margin from doing that discount, and that, you know you'd be losing losing um, margin on products that you know customers would have bought anyway, perhaps at a at a lesser discount. Um, so you know it, it can be you know useful if you really want to drive you know, short-term gains um, but um, I think it, it you generally will, will find that you know segmenting your or planning your promotions in a more nuanced way um, and being more targeted um, and more thoughtful about exactly what you're trying to who you're trying to target with the promotion and what kind of uplift you're expecting um, then you, you'll generally see more long-term benefit so whether that's you know doing um, brand-based promotions that you know perhaps you can have your your brand partners, your suppliers contribute to, or whether that's um, you know actually um, you know, going product by product and and being able to promote the products that that actually matter to customers and, and drive um, incremental uplifts that way um, tends to have a, a better better uplift. I think the the the, the kind of broad brush um, promotion that sometimes does work a little better is like a spend stretch type promotion where you know whether it's an individual product you know buy 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 two get one free but or it's spend a hundred dollars and and get twenty dollars um, extra that type of promotion you know does have you know often does have the effect of um, of expanding your basket and, and kind of customers putting extra things in there that they may not have already done so um, so you know if, if you are you know, looking to um, to use you know a, a broad brush tactic that is easy to implement. Sometimes a spend stretch is, is a better way to go. How would you describe Apple's pricing strategy? Uh, I think yeah, I think Apple's one of those companies where um, it, it's a relatively easy strategy to implement because you're it's similar to being the price leader in you know in in a uh, in in the opposite end of the spectrum in a, in a um, in a um, you're a really big retailer and you, and you have really you know strong buying power, um, you can be the price leader. In Apple's case, they have such a strong brand that they can almost set the price to be you know whatever they like. And I'm sure that they do um, some analysis, elasticity analysis on if we set the price here, what's the impact of sales? If we set the price there, what's the impact of sales? Um, and 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 because you know they are the benchmark. Um, they don't really need to. I assume that they don't really need to look too much at the competition. They, they probably do benchmark themselves to to, to the Samsungs of the world, but um, I would assume that they um, they're, they're more interested in trying to optimize for the volume and, um, um, and and try to set the price as high as they can. Um, but um, you know, they're still trying to trying to get customers to to upgrade from the last the, the last version of the of the product, which they they seem to do pretty well at. Um, but it, it will. It, it's interesting, though, that you know the, 
the 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 improvements, I suppose, from from version to version of the iPhone and, and the other products um, used to be, you know, a lot bigger. Um, and and so the incremental benefit of of the next version versus the prior one, um, you know, there, there seems to be some sort of diminishing return there. So I don't know if that will have that will have an impact and play out over the next couple of years, but um, they they certainly seem to be able to come up with um, ways to you know just to still drive um, customers to, to want to buy the next version every time. You mentioned testing elasticity, like price elasticity, uh, economics one hundred and one. How would you suggest e-commerce, you know, um, retailers or e- e-commerce businesses test that elasticity of, of pricing before they sort of settle down on on a price that that really works um, for both profitability and um, volume, their, their volume targets. Yeah, so um, it's it's not always easy to to measure for every type of product. So. Um, I would suggest first trying it on products that you have a reasonably consistent baseline on. So a product that you maybe sell enough units per week um, that you have a fairly consistent and the baseline. If you look at the average over time, if you exclude promotional periods, the baseline looks relatively consistent or, or at least in line with your overall growth of your business. Um, and so from there, you've got you know a baseline and an average um, sales per week, volume per week sold of that product. And then what you could do is do some A-B testing of promotions. So the next time you're running a promotion, um, you know, if you're running a 20% off or a 10% off, um, obviously your, your price goes down and you expect to see an incremental uplift in volume. Um, for a lot of products, you'll see it'll be a very obvious price goes down, volume goes up. And in those cases, it's, it's relatively easy to measure the elasticity and and then to predict um, in the future, if you run a deeper discount, you should get a, an incrementally bigger uplift, and, and 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 therefore you can use that information going forward. For for other products, it's a lot more grey. You know, it, there's there's obviously usually a lot a lot of noise in there. Um, so um, and and usually products with a higher interpurchase interval that you know you don't have you might not have a lot of sales every week or they're a bit patchy or there's other um, factors at play, seasonal factors, um, then it becomes a little bit harder to, to really derive a good elasticity number. Um, but, you know, it, it does tend to be products that are, you know, highly competitive, sought after, um, they're the ones, you know, that, that, that do tend to have, um, you, know, um, you know, strong elasticity. If you, if, you, if, you, if you provide a discount to a customer, they will buy more of that product. Um, so just knowing, you know, if you do some tests on specific products, then you might just have an idea of generally for each of your categories um, how elastic they are and, and how, how they react to promotions. Um, so certain categories will, you know, drive a lot of uplift during a promotional period and others not so much. Hmm. But you also want to make sure that, you know, if customers are, depends on the type of the product, if, if it's a product that customers do buy consistently, you know, supermarket example is is, is different to um, you know a piece of clothing that they might buy once a year. So if it's something like um, you know something they buy all the time, then they they can stockpile that product during a promotional period. So we generally call that forward buying. And so essentially, you're just stealing sales from a future period um, if if you run a promotion. And so yeah. um, when you're when you're measuring elasticity, you want to also um, you know account for the effect of forward buying or, or cannibalization as well. So you might have also stolen sales from another product that the customer may have already bought as well. So um, um, a few elements to consider there, but um, having a good idea of you know, how reactive um, your sales are to promotions is, is a good thing to, to know. Yeah, pricing is very, very, very dicey. If you, yeah, you know, the, the the buying, um, bringing your future forward is 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 a big. I you know I've experienced it a, experienced it a number of times, a number of times. I want to speak to retention. So we tend to reward customers who subscribe um, with discounts. So it could be a ten percent or a fifteen percent discount longer term. On the flip side. Cell phone operators or mobile phone providers tend to give cheaper prices to new customers. So they're, they're kind of like completely polar opposite strategies. What are your thoughts on maximizing customer lifetime value 
for for retailers, particularly retailers that have that subscription edge or have the ability to generate, you know, repeat customers over time? How does pricing really get into that CLV equation long term? Yeah, I think you definitely need you definitely need some acquisition strategies, but you also definitely need some retention strategies. So, you know, the, the acquisition strategy tends to be, yeah, discount off the first order. Um, you know, sign up to our newsletter. You'll get a you'll get a coupon code for ten percent off your first order. That that kind of thing, and and that's a great way to to uh, as we mentioned before to to drive your you know um, uh, reward program. You know, have more customers kind of sign up and and be part of your community and and be able to then market to them um, as long as you keep providing them incentives. And and there comes the the retention piece. Um, if if your existing customers are seeing you reward new customers. Um, uh, you know, usually these offers are sort of new customers only type thing. Um, then, then you're going to, you know, create some 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 trust issues there. So, um, you also want to, yeah, definitely have ways to to incentivize and reward existing customers, whether that's through some sort of club or member pricing program. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, e-com retailers these days have separate member pricing online um, to their normal pricing, um, which which can can work in in some cases. Um, it can get a bit Kind of, I think from a UX point of view, it sometimes looks a little clunky depending on the implementation. But um, definitely, again, another way for you to drive membership to your reward program if you've got member pricing or, or like an, uh, either a, um, a percentage of discount or specific pricing per product if you're a member. Um, that's, a, that's also a good way to drive retention. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, sort of subscription type pricing. Um, we, we, we work with a couple of retailers in the pet space. And um, you know, um, you subscribe to, you know, to have your your pet's food, de- you know, delivered once a month or once a fortnight. You'll get a discount um, off of that as well. So um, that type of repeat purchase subscription discount is also starting to become a lot more common for for retention of customers too. Mm-hmm. Okay, so with Shopgrok, I want to talk about Shopgrok. You, you know, you you've worked with the likes of. Aldi. Aldi is huge um, when it comes to pricing. You know, it can't get any in the UK at least. There's, there's Aldi and there's Lidl. They're hugely price competitive. You walked with the likes of Woolworths, which is which is the equivalent of the Tesco. It's it's huge again in in um, in Australia and and KFC. What what are the learnings we can take? You know, in in the SMB space from from this huge retailers pricing, um, you know, um, takeaways, um, particularly how Shoprock has you know essentially helped them execute on 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 their pricing strategies. Yeah, I think um, as we mentioned before, um, you know, we, we work with a lot of large retailers and 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 lots of smaller retailers. I think the the advantage of being being smaller is is being nimble and and being able to to react quickly, um, and um, and you know you also don't have that cost of doing business that a lot of these larger retailers have. So you know if you're competing against um, retailers that have a store footprint, they have a, a much larger fixed cost, and um, and they'll need to be making a margin on that to to continue to operate. So um, I think that actually it's um, you know assuming that you can build a build a brand and and bring customers to your site, and you've got some way of differentiating um, using one of the, the levers that we mentioned earlier. Um, you definitely can compete in, in, in this market. Um, it is, you know, it is competitive and there are, there is consolidation happening. The bigger retailers are getting bigger. They're, they're getting um, more sophisticated. Their, their digital presence is, is growing. Um, and, um, and so, you know, it is a, a difficult environment, but I, I do think that, you know, if you can build a brand, um, Particularly if you can build, you know, have have exclusive products or or, um, or, or ways in which to um, drive customers, whether it's through your your service or your your delivery or um, other ways to to kind of differentiate yourself. Um, there definitely, you know, are ways um, that that you can you know, build a strong business and and grow rapidly um, and compete against the likes of, of, of the big supermarkets. Okay. What do you want to describe Aldi's pricing strategy? Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't um, I haven't come to have worked with them recently, but I certainly from, from a um, uh, from a um, 
customer point of view, I mean, they're one of these retailers that, that has a pure EDLP strategy. So they do almost no promotion and they're simply driving, you know, they have a, a small range. So they, they'd have a smaller range than a typical Tesco, for example, um, mm-hmm. maybe only a couple of thousand products. But because they have such a narrow range, it means they can be, um, you know, they can negotiate very hard on that on that product to get a really good cost price from the supplier and therefore pass on a really low cost to the consumer. So um, they work very hard, I think, on, you know, from an outsider's point of view, on, um, you know, making sure that every single product in that range um, is is of use to the customer, keeping the range as narrow as possible. So only offering usually just one choice in a particular category, maybe two, um, whereas the bigger, you know, Tesco's of the world will have several brands competing in the one category. Um, whereas you know, the Audis of the world will just have you know their own one brand that they're um, that they're very cost cost um, efficient on. Um, they may have one or two tiers of products, and a good and a better, and not necessarily a best. Um, so they're, they're definitely competing at that entry price point level. Um, mm-hmm. And they don't try they don't necessarily try and um, do things that um, that are not part of their value proposition. So you know they don't really have an e-com presence. Um, they they don't really do a lot of ecom uh, related marketing etc. Um, they uh, I, I've I've read that they are trying to build that, but um, but certainly their 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 bread and butter is um, you know customers going in store um, yeah. and and getting better better prices for, for the, what they buy in the supermarket. Um, so um, it, it is an interesting you know strategy. It, it's not really something that can be. There's not a lot I think that can be derive from it as a an SMB e-com retailer other than just to be wary that that you know that that competition does exist out there um you know it it'd be hard for a startup to come in and and really compete you know in, in that kind of environment um without mm-hmm. the scale that they have to to really um get get really good costs from the suppliers so um it, it's it's kind of one of those ones where um it, it's it's good to know that it's out there but I don't think it's something that necessarily you know, should be replicated for a, uh, a, a pure play ecom player that's trying to trying to start out and make a an impact. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Why would KFC need a pricing strategy? There, that, that, that there's no other sort of chicken um, fast food chicken retailer. Who who are they benchmarking against? Yeah, so we do we do a bit of work in the in the QSR quick service retail fast fast food type space. And also in in other quick quick delivery spaces, so that you know the last couple of years there's been some consolidation, but the sort of um, gorillas uh, fast delivery, milk run fast delivery was one that was in mm-hmm. Australia that, that recently collapsed. Um, so you know these types of um, companies um, these days, if I go to the KFC example, um, they're probably competing, you know, not just with other chicken. Uh, food outlets, I suppose, but they're competing with just fast food in general. I guess you know the con- mm-hmm. consumer that's wanting to spend fifteen to twenty dollars, fifteen to twenty pounds on a um, on a meal, uh, I guess. Um, and so um, for them, they'd be looking at you know the likes of McDonald's and and, and other fast food providers, um, and um, trying to set their prices accordingly. Um, but these days, because of you know the way fast food is is going and the way customers demands are, are increasing um it's not necessarily just about the price which is important but also how do you do bundling how do you kind of do your uh combo your meal sizes small medium large your six nuggets 12 nuggets 18 nuggets how does that price architecture work and then um how do you optimize your pricing across your different channels whether it's pick up in store uh, delivery via your app, delivery via Uber, delivery via DoorDash, and yeah. you know, all the service charges that go with that. Do you have a, a high um, sort of order service charge um, and then a lower percentage uh, sort of uplift on your Uber price? So most, most companies these days will have uh, some sort of increase in price if you buy it via Uber than you know, in store. Um, but you can optimize maybe to have uh, a larger, you know, percentage increase on your Uber price, but um, a, a, um, a lower uh, per order price. Um, mm-hmm. So th- there's lots of different ways that um, the quick service retailers will optimize to try to to drive uh, consumers to their to, to buy their product. 
Um, so it's a, it's a far more dynamic uh, market than, than you might think um, hmm. in that space. I find this super fascinating and I could go on and on and on. On a final note with 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 um with Shop Grok, how can you be of service to pure play digital, you know, e commerce, you know, players or, you know, just e copy you know, um essentially e commerce businesses? How, how are you of service to to, to, to us? Yeah, so um, we we help we've helped lots of different um pure play e com retailers um scale up as they grow and, and we offer um, services for, for, for retailers of all sizes. Um, so, you know, if, if there's retailers that are just starting out, often the, the starting point is simply to take those, we help them find out what are those you know, 50 or 100 products that really matter to the customer, um, let's benchmark you to the market and provide you with some um, some useful analytics um, to help you um, set and, and derive your pricing strategy and your promotion strategy. And mm -hmm. some some reporting to help you, um, you know, determine if you're meeting um, the objectives that you've set, um, mm -hmm. and and are you remaining price competitive over time? Um, and then as you grow, you know, that there might be um, more more room for you to, to to delve deeper into things like price elasticity, as we mentioned, promotional effectiveness, understanding how how, how effective your promotions are, are they really driving the uplift mm -hmm. that you want them to? Um, and then the probably the next area would be then um, product range. So you know, understanding what products do you currently have in your range, um, what does the competition have in their range in terms of brands and, and um, pricing tiers and that kind of thing, and where might there be some gaps that you may want to fill over time, whether it's through new product development or bringing new brands on board or um, or, or other other options. Um, so um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, lots of ways we can help um, small and medium-sized e-com players mm. get started and remain competitive in, in the pretty competitive market at the time. Oh, super exciting, super exciting. I want to geek out here a little bit. I, I, I'm, I'm just theorizing here, whereby you, there must be a way you can measure your, your brand equity from insights you get from your price elasticity. And if your price elasticity elasticity is 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 less in elastic over time, like an apple, you know you have you know good brand equity. Just does that make sense? And is there a way to benchmark that over time? Your your price elasticity over time to understand, okay, um, how are people you know, essentially valuing our brand and through pricing? Yeah, I think there's 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 ways in which I mean I would say uh, measuring the uh, effectiveness of your brand is not necessarily something we do specifically, but th and there definitely mm -hmm. are, are services out there that we we've, we've worked alongside um, that, that can help you do that specifically. For example, you know how, what reach do you have? How many customers mm -hmm. you know know of your brand and um, and how is that growing over time? And what do people think about your your brand? Um, and a lot of that tends to be a bit more qualitative as far as research goes. Um, mm -hmm. you know, get, getting panels of customers and and, um, and collecting bits of research as to um, what they think of your brand. But then what we often find is, um, you know, either we, if we do that alongside what we're doing, or if you already have some of that internally, we often can correlate the actual uh, price performance of your of your company, which we do measure against some of these qualitative insights. So one thing that um, we often help do is. Um, correlate your actual price index over time so uh, do your you know your, your price index versus the competition um, versus the, the perception of your prices so if you, if you might have a qualitative piece of research or a panel that um, you know every once in a while you go to this panel once a month and you ask them some key questions you know does my brand brand X um, have, have low prices or do they have great promotions you know, and it might be a scale type um, questionnaire. Um, and then over time, you, you usually can see the qualitative measures uh, correlate to the to the qu quantitative measures. And so, um, we we definitely help some of our retail customers set um, this kind of um, performance measurement up, so that over time they can see how much does price drive um, overall perception of the brand. Um, and then we also usually will have an input into um, if there's a performance marketing team or an e-com team that's looking at, you know, uh, traffic and visitation against mm -hmm. you know, SEMrush or similar web or, or other services that are looking um, at, at, at their website traffic, we can 
usually put our data alongside that to see, okay, if traffic is down or up in a certain week, is that related to price? How much does that correlate to how your prices were, how the market prices were in that week or, or that month? Mm-hmm. Uh, or is it something else? Yeah, it could be that you know there's something wrong with UX, there's something wrong with the creative, there's something wrong with the marketing. So um, we tend to be you know a part of the overall picture, but definitely an important one. Yeah, you, at least you can superimpose and see that there are any correlations, you know, at least, you know, from, from that perspective, especially if there have been any major, you know, price updates. Yeah. Aaron, it's, it's been a pleasure, you know, having you. I've, I've left this conversation smarter, uh, just knowing more about pricing. So, and I'm sure everybody who's made it to this point uh, would, would say the same. For people who want to find out more, you know, about shop growth, Shoprock, it's s h o p g r o k dot com. I will link to it in the show notes. You're active on LinkedIn. Um, I think we're connected on LinkedIn now. We'll also link to your to your LinkedIn. Are you active on any other social platforms? I think LinkedIn is is the main one at the moment. Um, I'm trying mm-hmm. to increase my presence. Uh, it's not my natural uh, kind of mode. Is to, is to kind of um, you know be be open on social media. But, but these days, I'm I'm trying to be more active on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best place to start. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you again for coming on the show. Enjoy Madrid. And yeah, we'll 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 catch up sometime soon. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed the chat. Cheers.